Hi, I'm Ben Graham. Welcome to our College to Career Lecture. Uh, and the purpose of doing this is to put a little bit of an analytic framework around this process of mapping the things you're doing uh, as an undergraduate student to explorations and planning related to what you're going to do after graduation. Um, and, and in some sense, the most important part of this is to put you in a position where you think through these things. Um, so there may not be anything magically insightful in what I'm going to say kind of over the next 20 minutes, but hopefully what it does is get you thinking through this process, right? Because in the drumbeat of trying to take your classes and excel in your extracurriculars and maintain a social life and get a little bit of sleep, right? There's never time to look two, three, 10 years down the road, right? Um, but the ability to kind of pick your eyes up and look into that more distant horizon um, allows you to use uh, the time that you have right now a little bit more strategically. Okay, so the outline of what I'm gonna go through here is we're gonna talk about uh, sort of some general analytical categories in terms of careers based on gen high general intelligence versus careers based on specific skills. We're gonna talk about interpersonal relationships as valuable professional assets. We're gonna talk about the process of finding your way. Okay, if you're gonna spend some time and energy trying to think about uh, the future of your career, what's the best way to sort of structure that exploration? Um, and then we'll have some brief notes on, on graduate school. Okay, so uh, specific skills versus high general intelligence. So high general intelligence fields are things like consulting, investment banking, law, um, heading into these fields, generally uh, a high GPA from an elite university kind of helps uh, enter into the top echelons of these fields. Um, you know, these are fields where they're generally, they're trying to hire the smartest person in the room and then they'll teach them the specific skills that go with those uh, professions. It's not like investment banking or the law doesn't involve a lot of uh, specific skills, but that entry filters are mostly focused on uh, selecting the smartest people in the room. Okay, then high specific skill fields, things like medicine, statistics, computer science, um, these are a lot focused on those early stages, those early filtering stages of entry into these careers are highly focused on, has this person uh, absorbed the requisite uh, sort of underlying material or developed the requisite underlying skills, whether that is, um, you know, have you done your organic chemistry before you go to medical school? Uh, can you write in Java or HTML or C++ uh, before you are heading into um, a job or even a master's program in computer science, right? Similarly with statistics, it's like, have you done your calculus? Have you done, uh, you know, your linear algebra, right? Okay. And so we can sort of see the difference here. Uh, if we look at the LSAT, which is the exam you take to get into law school versus the MCAT. And the MCAT is something you spend months studying for and you study in particular, it's, it is a lot of things like, like organic chemistry where it's like, it's very specific sort of factual knowledge uh, that they're uh, grilling you on in the MCAT. The LSAT is more like abstract logic problems about like how, how well can you reorder these cans on a shelf to make them fit in this pattern kind of thing, right? It's, it's kind of testing whether you can think in a particular analytical way, um, but it's not uh, testing you on the rules of civil procedure or something like that. Okay. So um, if you are thinking about entry into a specific skill-based field, how do you get those skills, right? So valuable skills are scarce uh, and they're increasing in demand. And skills are scarce when they're difficult or unpleasant to acquire, or when they have bad reputations, where they have reputations of being difficult or unpleasant to acquire. Sometimes, you know, I, you know, you'll hear from me, you'll hear me make several pitches for um, sort of quantitative social science, for statistics, for data science as a as a skill set that I think is very valuable in the professional world. Um, but I also think it tends to be less difficult to acquire than it seems from the outside. I think it has a reputation um, for being more difficult than it actually is. Um, sometimes skills are scarce because they re require unique or specific talents, right? And sometimes skills are scarce because they're brand new. Um, data science and computer science sort of fit into this, right? Where, you know, in the data science case, um, you know, a computer that could run a basic linear regression, which is kind of the workhorse model in statistics, you know, you couldn't buy one of those as a, as a student 
you know, until kind of the late 90s very easily, right? Um, you know, that, that computers were just real, that could do much in the way of statistical computing, just, yeah, I mean, they weren't available in the 80s. And so if you think about like, okay, if somebody went to college in the 80s, you know, if they were 22 years old in 1985 or something like, how old are they now, right? Well, that was only 35 years ago. That's somebody who right now is, you know, sort of, you know, that's upper management age right now, right? And so the folks who are in upper management right now didn't have the option of learning statistics in nearly the way that we do now, sort of the sort of uh, computation-based uh, uh, statistics where there's a lot of programming and that sort of thing involved. Those were much harder skills to learn in the 80s. Um, and so people in senior management don't tend to have them, right? don't tend to have those skills unless they really worked hard on reacquiring and sort of redeveloping their toolkit as they went through their career. So a lot of times what you'll find is there's, you know, kind of in the room where it happens, sort of the high level of a large organization where the key decisions are being made, you'll see a lot of people in their 50s and 60s, and then you'll see some 30-year-old sitting in the room um, who is the, uh, you know, kind of the data person in the room, right? Um, okay, how do you get these scarce skills, right? Um, classes are a good way to do it, right? You're paying money for a lot of things when you pay for tuition, but one of them is sort of the opportunity to be walked through the development of these scarce skills. Uh, internships are great skill development opportunities, and so are your extracurricular activities. Um, a fair number of people who get jobs upon graduation will get jobs based on skills that they've developed in their extracurriculars, whether that's the Applied Statistics Club, or I mean, there's a club that does competitions in um, construction management plans, right? Like uh, working on developing the plans for, for these large complex construction projects like skyscrapers where you've got dozens of contractors and all sorts of permits and this and that, right? Like that management process. There's an extracurricular club at USC structured around that, right? And, and those are, um, there's uh, investment clubs, there's clubs where you're, you know, building uh, race cars and this sort of stuff like those, you know, so extracurriculars are often these skill development opportunities. Okay. Now, if we're in the high general intelligence fields, um, and you're trying to enter these, one of the things you're trying to do is to certify uh, that you possess high general intelligence, right? Because it's actually really quite hard to hire the smartest person in the room. It's hard to observe uh, intelligence, right? Um, and we're generally very bad at that. Um, uh, so what are some of the signals that you can acquire to convince somebody that you're one of the smartest people in the room? Um, and one of the things you can do is you can choose a hard major and excel at it, right? Um, you can think about what are the majors that are the best signals of high general intelligence. You know, if you hear that somebody's a neuroscience major or a physics major or something like that, ooh, that person must be really smart, right? Okay. Um, fellowships and awards matter here, right? A lot of the same kind of gold stars that you needed to earn in high school to get admitted to USC are the same kind of gold stars that help you uh, get hired in the corporate recruiting rounds for, uh, for consulting or something like that, and that help you get admitted into law school. Um, but in addition to high general intelligence, there are actually two skills that I would say that you tend to need in these high general intelligence fields, and those are writing and public speaking. Right? Um, that those kind of, no matter what you're entering, what field you're entering, um, if you're entering a field that is required, uh, that's based on where your contribution to the organization is based on what's in your brain, um, then you need skills that are, uh, that serve to transfer ideas in your brain into other people's brains. Because as long as they sit only in your own brain, it's very hard for the organization that's paying you a salary to take advantage of those ideas that you have. Um, so while you are in college, work really hard to develop these two skills. Um, you have, it's much harder to develop, to continue to develop these after you graduate. You have great resources around you right now. So seize opportunities for public speaking, right? If you're in group projects and one person's going to present, man, get in there and be the one who presents that group project. Um, seize the opportunity to uh, speak on a panel on somebody's talk show on the campus TV station, right? Take an acting class where you're speaking on the stage, get involved in improv comedy, whatever your avenue is to get in front of people um, uh, and speak or join Toastmasters, right? Which is something you can continue to do after graduation, right? It's not tied to, to USC in any way, um, but it's an organization around practicing and getting comfortable with public speaking, right? Um, and then writing, you know, writing is really time consuming to teach. There's no substituting um, sitting down with somebody's piece of writing one-on-one -on -one and going through kind of line by line, helping them improve that writing. 
Um, don't pass up someone who's willing to work with you in that way. And in particular, take advantage of the writing center here at USC, right? You guys can schedule these one-on-one -on -one meetings with professional writing instructors at no, at no additional cost to you, right? You've already paid for it with your tuition. Uh, take advantage of that. Like, yes, the Writing Center serves a lot of, student, a lot of students for whom English is a foreign language um, or students who are struggling with their writing. But man, even if you're an excellent writer, take advantage of that to like just take your writing to the next level. Like this is an incredible resource. Write your draft paper a week earlier than you have to and give yourself time to go into the Writing Center once or twice. Um, you're not going, there is no Writing Center at your first job, right? Um, take advantage of that now. Okay. Now I want to talk about relationships as professional assets. And like, look, the whole idea of networking and kind of using personal ties uh, as something professionally valuable can feel a little bit icky. But I want to talk to you about like, what is the practical value here, right? That a lot of, um, look, when you attend a place like USC, a lot of the students around you are going to go on to do pretty amazing things. Uh, you know, in nonprofit organizations, in government, in firms, right? They are going to be movers and shakers in the world. Um, and so those peer relationships are gonna be valuable to you now. You know, I've been encouraging you a lot to, um, you know, to, to group up with other people. I've been encouraging you to have your classmates read drafts of your papers, right? To, um, you know, to work collaboratively, even on your homework assignments, as long as you acknowledge it, right? Like I want you guys drawing on your peers to get through your classes. Um, but as you go into the professional world, you'll continue to draw on your peers for advice, um, for connections and introductions, right? Okay. Your relationships with professors, right? Like, you know, you guys pay a lot of tuition to have access to time from me and other faculty members. Um, and office hours are generally speaking for most professors undersubscribed. Right? They're sitting there in their office and nobody's coming by most of the time, maybe right before or right after the midterm exam, this sort of thing. But like, um, you know, especially around the end of the semester, that's a great time to go develop that mentoring relationship, take advantage um, of their abilities, right? Um, work as their research assistants, that kind of thing. Like, and, and I think, you know, okay, so I write a lot of letters of recommendation and I'll write at least a letter of recommendation for, for pretty much anybody who asks me. Um, but I, will, I can write a great letter for somebody who's been in my office hours a bunch and has really talked with me about their different career choices as they're developing them, or especially has been my research assistant, um, you know, worked with me uh, kind of in a sustained way and demonstrated excellence to me in a way that then I can allows me to vouch for them. Uh, and for the students who, who truly impress me and write, are able to really demonstrate excellence to me in ways that where I'm confident that I can vouch for their abilities, I'll make phone calls for those people. I make introductions, right? Like, and a lot of faculty will do this for you, but they need to know you really well before they can vouch for you that way. So get to know your faculty. And look, in general, professors are not the people with the greatest social skills. That's not what academics are known for. So if you go into office hours and you have a kind of awkward conversation with the professor, it's probably not you, it's probably them, right? And like, you gotta try with a few different professors before you find a couple with whom you click and where you can kind of form that relationship and start to develop that mentoring relationship and have somebody who's gonna go to bat for you, not just while you're an undergrad and you need a letter of rec to get into some study abroad program, but two or three or five years after graduation um, when they're serving as references or this sort of thing for jobs and for graduate school and, and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, and you also form really important relationships through your internships, right? You're developing some skills there, but you're also developing your professional network. Same thing with your extracurriculars, right? And then there are these professional associations, right? So most, uh, most um, industries have professional associations. So there's like, there's an American uh, political science association that all the political science scientists in the country, uh, many of them are, are members of, right? And there are uh, different bar associations and sort of um, for, for lawyers and there are, um, there are professional organizations for things like construction management and for different types of engineers and all this sort of stuff. Um, certainly a lot of uh, professional organizations in the medical community, right? Many of these professional organizations have meetings that are, that are open to anyone who wants to attend them, right? And when you're somebody who's exploring a field, showing up at a gathering of a professional association and talking with people there about what they like about the career and what they don't and wish, what they wish they'd known when they were 20 years old and, and, and that sort of thing, what they wish they'd done while they were undergrads. Um, if you're sort of the, 
uh, smart and interested uh, young person present at that meeting, you're probably the most interesting person there for most uh, folks to talk to, right? I'm really lucky as a professor that I get a lot of opportunities to mentor um, smart and, and exciting and driven uh, young people. Uh, most people in their professional lives don't get a chance to do that nearly as much as they would like. Um, and so, um, so, so don't be shy about initiating that. And we'll come back at sort of like how you initiate some of those um, informational interviews and those uh, early stage mentoring meetings. Um, and this is because this is part of those kind of the finding your way here. Like really do some active research in careers. I don't know about all of you, but like when I showed up uh, on my first day of college, I kind of knew about like three careers. I was like, I could be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. And beyond that, like I, I don't really know what white collar professionals do all day, right? Like other than that, like the careers I kind of know about sort of where I, I was like, you can be a farmer, you can work in construction, uh, you know, like that was kind of, you can work in retail, like, that was kind of what I knew, right? Um, figuring out, like, there were so many jobs. Like, I didn't know what a consultant did. Like, what, what, what is that, right? Like, I had no clue, right? And so um, doing a lot of research to actually sit down and sort of, like, Google different professions <laughs> that you've heard of and that, like, you know, and trying to figure out what they're all about. Um, and if you can find a job title that seems interesting to you, if you find a profession that sounds cool, uh, then go and find some people on LinkedIn and you can do a search for like just people who are affiliated in some way with USC. It's mostly USC alumni. Like you can restrict to people who have USC somewhere in their profile when you do a search of LinkedIn. Find a USC alum who has that job. I mean, we'll start by finding anyone who has that job and look at their resume. See what things they did. What did they major in? What did they do after graduation, right? What did the early stages look like for them? And then reach out to them and ask for an informational interview, right? And they don't have to be a USC alum for you to reach out and sort of like cold reach out to them and ask for that. Um, and you may cold reach out to five or six people before one of them says yes. Um, but especially within USC alums, like well, your hit rate might actually be pretty high. Um, and putting yourself out there and, and requesting those, uh, those informational interviews then gives you a chance to talk to that person one-on-one -on -one and figure out a lot more. So how do you do that? If you found somebody who has a job that you think you might want and you're trying to figure out more about that job so you can figure out, A, is this something that I really want to explore? And B, if I do want to explore, how, how do I get there? Um, how do we do that? So from your first piece of correspondence forward, you want to signal respect for their time and expertise. And you do that less by saying over and over again how much you respect their time and expertise and more by demonstrating it with your actions. So do your homework in advance. If they're working for a company currently, figure out what that company does. If they have a job title, figure out what's publicly available about their job title. So you can be like, so I've read up a little bit about sort of what lead engineer, what full stack engineer means. And I think it means this. Can you tell me in the context of your firm exactly what it is you do, right? Show that you've done a little bit of homework, right? When you send that initial email, make a specific request, right? And usually you want to ask for 20 minutes of their time. Right? It's like a good kind of, this is what you're asking for. Um, in that very first email, you can provide a long list of your availabilities. I'm available in this window on this date, in this window on this date, in this window on this date. What that allows the person to do is to read your email. And if they're willing to meet with you, send one reply where they say, yeah, I'd be happy to meet with you. I have 20 minutes available on Tuesday the 14th um, at 3 p.m right, where it can be scheduled, like it can be on and off their desk in one email. It's not four emails back and forth trying to figure out times. It's like they can one and done this, right, which is really important if they're busy. Um, you're making an off, so you're providing your availabilities, you're offering to meet near their work, right? The address of the company they work at is public. Be like, uh, I see that the address of your business, you know, of this company is here. Is that the office you work at? If so, I see there's a Starbucks across the street. We could meet there right kind of thing like you've done your homework and you're making this as easy for them as possible right if they do take the time to meet, and you can also suggest like a zoom meeting I mean, certainly in this context uh but even um you know when we are living in that great happy post-covid time that we hope is coming um you know suggesting a zoom or a phone meeting can also be uh you know in person is always the best way to form a human connection but it can be simpler for people to to meet remotely um but if somebody does take the time to meet with you and you spent, you know, obviously you're going to show up on time, right? Which means if you're in LA and you're trying to get somewhere in, in person, you're going to show up 20 minutes early because if you don't show up 20 minutes early, you're risking being late because you can never predict traffic in LA, right? Okay, so you're going to be on time for sure. You're going to be dressed professionally. All these, you're going to have done your homework, have some questions. If they spend 20 minutes with you, then you're sending this follow-up, this thank you uh, afterwards, right? And if they've given you advice, follow it. 
right? Like that's one of the ways you demonstrate respect for their time and expertise, right? Um, so if you solicit advice from somebody and then you follow that advice and then you follow up with them like six months later and say, hey, you know, this is what I did and I followed your advice this way, thanks so much. And now I'm doing this and that. Um, that person feels really good. A, they took time to give you advice and you followed it. So they feel respected. But now they're also really invested in your success, right? And this is like, you know, this is kind of the psychological flip here. This per you ask this person, like, how do I succeed in growing up to be like you in some respect, right? So you're showing a huge amount of respect for them. Uh, and then they've told you how to do it. And then you're following their advice. In some sense, like now they're really invested in you not failing because they gave you that advice. If you follow and it doesn't work, they're going to feel bad about the advice they gave you. So now they're even more invested. And in, like, and this is what you want is you want a relationship that develops with them. And hopefully, you know, a lot of this is, uh, you know, is you form a, a, a uh, just a, a genuine interpersonal connection. But like in this process of signaling respect for somebody and following their advice, you also kind of get them invested in your professional success in a way that then has them offering to make phone calls for you or introduce you to their friend that they know who you might want to talk to or this kind of thing um, and building toward um, a professional network that helps you get that first job, right? Okay. And so um, last thing that we're going to talk about uh, kind of in terms of me pushing information out at you uh, is, is a question that I get asked a lot, which is, should I go to grad school? And sort of some things to think about when you make that decision. Um, one of the things that I'll put out there is that mediocre grad schools, like, so generally we're talking master's programs here, but mediocre programs usually cost almost as much as the truly elite institutions. Like if you look at, you know, whatever the master's program is, if you look at like what's the tuition in the top 10 programs in the country, however they're rating those, and you look at like the tuition in like programs ranked 50 through 100, they're not that different, right? Going to the 60th ranked program in the country or the third ranked program in the country is going to cost you about the same. So do what you can to get into a good program, right? Because your pro uh, career prospects coming out of the third ranked program and the 60th ranked program are somewhat different. Like, yes, you can graduate from, uh, from a very low ranked program and do extremely well in the world, right? Like if you look at the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, many of them graduated from colleges you've never heard of, right? Like there's no, it's not like attaining, attending elite institutions is the only way to uh, achieve stratospheric professional success, um, but it does make it easier. Uh, and so, in particular, invest in good test scores. That means actually blocking out a few months when you can spend, you know, 15 or 20 hours a week studying, uh, which is really hard to do. It's a major investment, right? Um, but try to do that for whatever exam it is you're going to be taking, um, whether that's the MCAT or the LSAT or whatever it is. Like these exams can be gamed, right? It's worth sort of, you know, getting the test prep books and figuring out the test taking strategies and doing the practice exams and all that, all that nonsense. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's a worthwhile investment. Um, also, get your letters of recommendation before you graduate. And this is probably the most, the thing that, uh, the most valuable piece of information in that I think it's advice you're not going to get from as many other, lots of people will tell you to study for the MCAT. Fewer people will remind you if you're going to take a few years off before you go to medical school, law school, whatever, or if you're only maybe thinking about going to graduate school in a couple of years, get letters of rec before you graduate. Because if you come back to a professor three or four years later, they've had several hundred students between you and, you know, since they last had you, right? And the, their ability to write a really compelling detailed letter has degraded over time. Whereas if you come to them in like March or April of your senior year or something, and you're like, hey, you know, I'm thinking about going to graduate school for public policy in a couple of years. Or I'm thinking about going to business school in a couple of years, but, but I'm going to take a couple of years off first. Would you mind writing me a letter of recommendation now and putting it in your file so that you have it to pull out in a couple of years. Most professors are gonna say yes, because they wanna be able to give you a good letter in a couple of years, and they know if they don't write it now, it's not gonna be a great letter. Um, I do have a letter of rec request guide that's up on my website, um, and I'll email it out to you uh, when we have sort of the in-person session of this too, um, which is gonna help you like, tee up that letter writer with all the things they need. You, you are providing all the anecdotes and the things that they can include in the letter. Like what's the specific evidence? Like what are the skills and knowledge that you've demonstrated to them? How have you demonstrated it to them? Like you really want to, you know, you're not um, telling them how to write the letter or whatever, but you're saying, look, here are some things you might think about including in a letter. I think that I've demonstrated this skill and that skill and this ability, and here's how I think I've demonstrated them. 
God, that helps the professor out a lot. It certainly helps me out a lot to have that work done for me. Then I can take the time I'm going to put into it and really polishing up the pros and really making that argument as, as uh, persuasive as I can. Um, okay, so that getting letters erect before you graduate, even if you're not 100% sure you're going to go to grad school, get those letters on file before you uh, graduate because then they can always add a paragraph or two three years later about what you've been up to since. But the key like details and anecdotes that really make a letter pop, those are already on paper for them. They're not going to forget it. In general, don't take on debt for a master's degree that doesn't directly qualify you for a specific job, right? A lot of you, you're really good students. You were great students in high school. You're great students in college. It's terrifying to go out onto the job market, right? It's much safer and much more fun just to stay in school, right? Just to take a master's degree because being a student is fun. Um, and look, if that's something you can afford to do, great. Like being co in college is super fun and more knowledge is wonderful and it enriches your life. So if you can afford that, wonderful. But if you're debt financing, like, I mean, like most folks are, I think, or many folks are, be really careful about taking on debt for a master's degree that isn't really tightly linked to a specific job and a specific job that's going to pay enough to pay back the debt that you're taking on, right? So, you know, when I see somebody go and get a master's degree in statistics or get a master's degree in computer science or get their law degree or get their MBA, I'm not too worried about their ability to pay back the debt because those are degrees that are tied to specific jobs that, that pay quite well, right? Debt financing degrees that aren't paid to, to high paying, that aren't tied to high paying jobs uh, is risky and can leave you saddled with debt for a very long time. Um, one thing to be aware of uh, is that many PhD programs are free, are fully funded. So, you know, for example, the PhD students who are teaching assistants in your classes when you take an IR or a political science class at USC, right? Those folks are all making, you know, $30,000 a year uh, with good health care while they are students, right? Um, and yeah, they're working as teaching assistants and they're working as research assistants or this and that. They are working half time uh, while they're students, but they're not taking on debt, right? Um, and they're getting a really valuable degree. And actually you can drop out of a PhD program after two years. And if you passed your qualifying exams, you have a master's degree, right? So, um, you know, they don't generally advertise that in PhD programs because it's not great for us when, when students do that, uh, but it can be a very smart choice for, for the student. Um, okay, so that's all the material that I have to kind of spout at you. I do love having these career conversations with students, so don't be shy about signing up for my office hours to talk through stuff. The thing that we're going to do in class and that I want to sort of, I'm going to put up on the, at the end of the video here so you can pause it and look at this. This is what we're going to run through when we come into class uh, for, for our college to career workshop, um, is we're going to sort of run through uh, this process with a partner and then we're going to flip and your partner's going to do it with you. So that's what, what class is going to be about when we're in person. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you all for that.